Right, so today um, we were going to talk uh, partly about Palestine and, and about Gaza and about Israel and about peace and about music. And I, I just wondered, when you were 10, moved to Israel, um, what impact do you think that actually had on your music for a start? And how soon did it have an impact on your politics? Well, the first thing that I remember was the shock of having to learn not only a new language, but a new alphabet. I had left uh, uh, Argentina uh, in the middle of the year because being in the southern hemisphere, July was the equivalent of our December. So I left end of July <coughs> and arrived in Israel at Christmas and we started going to school as I said, in a new language and with a new alphabet. So that was, uh, that's really what preoccupied me the most at that time, more than the music. The music was, uh, it, from that point of view, rel relatively easy. But um, there was something extremely positive about the, the general atmosphere. Uh, in, in Israel at the time. This would have been sort of 1953. Yeah, well, yeah. January 53. Yeah. And uh, uh, <coughs> it's actually quite interesting sometimes to look at uh, the development of the conflict, uh, of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict uh, from Israeli and Palestinian point of view together, but also independently. And if you look at the history of the modern history of Israel, uh, independently from the Palestinian side and the problem, uh, you see that the State of Israel was declared on the 15th of May 1948, at that time by Ben Gurion, who was the head of the Labour Party. Um, then there was the war. <coughs> the war was won. And the Labour Party remained in power in Israel until 1977. It's a very long time. And the Labour Party in Israel then was, uh, how shall I say, that was, was slightly different from Labour parties anywhere else. There was socialism in, a, in an active way, as I at least have not seen anywhere else. There were the kibbutzim, there was the moshav, the moshav where there was uh, common property but the possibility of individual earnings and the kibbutz where everything was collected. <clears throat> and it worked for such a long time and you have to ask yourself why. On, on the sort of uh, nationalistic side, the Labour Party had no opposition. The war had been won. So what more can a nationalist uh, party offer as a program? There was nothing to offer. And the religious parties were, some of them, uh, openly and overtly anti-Israeli because they believed there was no need for a state of Israel until the Messiah came and it had to be a religious state. No, no, this, this was true. So the Labour Party had absolutely no opposition to speak of. No opposition to, to, to speak of. And the socialist system worked much better than in many other places because I, I, I'm basically an optimist and I, I believe in, in the human beings' good intentions and good thoughts and good feelings. And therefore, I believe that hardly anybody in this world has anything against the idea of socialism. It's with the implementation that it is more uh, difficult. And you get extreme cases like in the Soviet Union and the other countries in Eastern Europe where people had the feeling they had enough of this idea of socialism and communism because they basically couldn't work for themselves, they only worked for the state. But the state of Israel was being created. It was in embryo. Therefore, you could work for the state and work for yourself and vice versa. And this is why humanly, it was a very positive uh, ambiente. 
there was a very positive atmosphere uh, in, in, in Tel Aviv at that time. There was, it was very much more, uh, I will come in a second if I may to the, to the changes, but, okay, but at that time it was very much um, based on uh, the uh, European Jews that had been coming. And, to, and secular. Pardon? Secular. Secular and European, secular and European that had been coming basically since the 20s. And there were two major uh, uh, centers of, if you want, of immigration. One was Central Europe, mostly German, Austrian, and Czech, and of course, the Eastern part, uh, the Russian and, and Polish. And that was very much uh, the basis of, uh, this is why so many, uh, so, so to speak, European at that time, much more than now, European activities were so uh, developed in Israel. Music for a start, and theater, but music, you know, the famous story when Yasha Haifetz came to play uh, in 1953, I think it was, and he played the Beethoven concerto, and he, uh, the, there was some misunderstanding about the car that was supposed to pick him up to take him to the rehearsal, and so he took a taxi, and the taxi driver recognized him and uh, said to him, Mr. Heifetz, what cadenza do you play the Beethoven concerto? <laughs> <laughs> but that was, that was uh, typical of Israeli society mm. then. You know, he probably, the man was probably a former professor at the university in Hanover or, or somewhere. <laughs> God only knows. Anyway, that was the picture of, of, uh, uh, of, of the society as I, as I remember. I have to say also, that the Holocaust was never mentioned. The children of my age, I was 10 at the time, were not interested. They didn't want to hear about all that. Not that they were not interested in this, they didn't care, but they wanted to create a new image of a healthy Jew that was not only about the studies of the Talmud or about music or being a banker, but of uh, agriculture, of uh, development in so many other areas, et cetera, et cetera. And the parents, of course, the parents of my schoolmates uh, who had suffered through the hell of the Holocaust didn't want to talk about it because it was much too painful. This was, after all, only seven years after the end of the war. You will see in a minute why I'm, uh, why I'm uh, telling you all this. Anyway, so you had a basically labor government based on socialism, or of course also on the idea that there was a justification for the Jewish people to be there. In other words, it was Zionist uh, socialism. Um, and that went on until 1967, 10 years before the country changed political direction. As a result of the 67 war, many things of what I have just uh, narrated now changed. First of all, there was very cheap Palestinian labor available in 19, from 1967 on for quite a number of years. Palestinians would come from Gaza, from Ramallah, from Nablus, from everywhere, to Haifa, to Tel Aviv, everywhere. And it was very cheap labor, much cheaper labor. Therefore, the first Israeli fortunes were uh, achieved, thereby eroding the idea of the socialism, number one. Politically, there, were, there was a situation where Israel was in control of so many territories, and therefore the logical question was, do we keep the territories or do we keep them, give them back? And there, there was an immediate difference of opinion at that time between the same Ben-Gurion who was already retired and the right-wing party, Begin, Herut was called at the time, what is today the Likud. And the religious parties, uh, started being more flexible 
about the date of the arrival of the Messiah. Because, <laughs> <laughs> because, because uh, they say these are not occupied territories. These are liberated territories. And they are not only liberated territories, they are biblical liberated territories. So maybe this has to be kept in waiting for the imminent arrival of the Messiah. And therefore, you had a clear choice politically and socially, uh, purposely refraining from uh, commenting for now on the, on, the, on the effect of all this on the Palestinians, which is not because of uh, that, uh, lack of importance, but just to really see the, the, the project. Um, in 1961, uh, Adolf Eichmann, had been brought to trial in Israel from Argentina uh, with the idea that it was extremely important for the uh, education of the new generation to come to really terms and to understand the horrors of all that. And it was a shattering experience. I was most of the time during the trial uh, in Israel and it was really very, very painful. Then comes the next change, and that is the fact that uh, Israel defense mechanism in the 50s and early 60s was very much based on French cooperation. The whole atomic, the saw, at that time, the, Today, President of Israel, Shimon Peres, was Minister of Defense, and he was the architect of that defense. But in 1967, uh, de Gaulle realized that uh, it was more in France's interest to be in good terms with the Arabs, especially with Iraq at the time, than Israel, and therefore made a clean break with that, and that put Israel or the Israelis put themselves entirely in the hands of the United States, thereby changing everything. You see how they changed. First, if it was a European-inspired society in the 50s, it became gradually more and more American-inspired. A lot of the contact to European culture was um, forgotten, and the, the, the state became much more American orientated with the result, or maybe the coincidence, this I, I, I would know, that there was quite a large immigration of religious Jews from Brooklyn who came with a very, very um, right wing mentality uh, and influenced very much the, the social climate in Israel, and in 1970, you see that in a very short time everything changed. In 1970, there was the first large immigration of Soviet Jews that were allowed out in 1970, and they also came with a, obviously different, because they were not religious, but a very similar right-wing way of thinking. They had suffered uh, from very strong anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union, let us not forget that in the passports, when it said nationality for Jews, they had to put Jewish, Jewish, as if it was a nationality, although they were Soviet nationals. But the anti-Semitism was very clear and very strong, and it, it, it's some of the time um, very open. The trials of the doctors in the 50s by Stalin, etc., etc. So they came from... Uh, having suffered several generations of very strong, open anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union, from suffering from being discriminated in every possible way, and suffered also from all the difficulties that the society suffered from lack of freedom and uh, lack of so many other things for which the Soviet Union was and is uh, criticized. And therefore, you had right-wing religious American Jewry combined with right-wing victims of communism Jewry from the Soviet Union. 
And that changed completely the makeup of Israeli society. Uh, there was, a, in the meantime, of course, also the uh, integration from other countries, non-European countries. There was the Iraqi Jews that came in the 50s and the Yemenite Jews that from then they got from Ethiopia, etc., etc., etc. So the whole makeup uh, changed completely. And as a result of all that, plus the Eichmann trial, suddenly the Holocaust, the memory of the Holocaust, and this is what I find, and I say that as an Israeli, as you know, I have many nationalities and things, but as an Israeli, I find that the most abhorring is the politicization of the remembrance of the Holocaust. Everything now has to be uh, uh, explained to the world in terms of the trauma that all the Jewish people suffered because of the Holocaust. I mean, certainly in no way reducing the horrors uh, of the of the Holocaust, but to say that uh, we cannot go to the peace table with the Palestinians because we don't get enough guarantees from them, we don't get this and we don't get the other, and we must avoid the second Holocaust. As if Palestinians' lack of acceptance of so many things to do with Israel, in a way, in an extreme case, even even about the existence of the state of Israel, to equate that with European anti-Semitism is totally wrong. And it is against all the, the tradition and uh, yeah, tradition of, of Jewish thought, of the morality of it. In any case, uh, this is how I, I feel the, the situation was, and therefore, when one talks about the modern state of Israel, one has to talk about it uh, in, in two periods, from 1948 until roughly 1967, if you want 77, because it all takes a little bit of time, and what happened since then. If you were just to look at present-day Israel and uh, look at the makeup of the country now, what percentage is left of that original secular uh, European idyll? I don't know. I'm, I'm 20%? I, I, would, I would not venture an opinion because I don't know enough precisely. You know, you, you have the feelings that uh, most Israeli uh, enlightened people vote with their feet by leaving the country. They don't vote at the elections, they simply go. Um, I don't know how many there are, but uh, Jerusalem is a very clear case. When I was uh, uh, even younger than now, <laughs> when I was uh, very young, I used to go to the lectures at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem of Martin Buber and Max Brod, who you know had been so close to Kafka. There was a lot of uh, all this has disappeared. Jerusalem is now. A, a, a sort of uh, mostly a religious uh, village has become a religious village on the on the Jewish uh, on the Jewish side. I think that with the passage of time and all these changes, uh, many Israelis have actually lost or ne maybe never had an idea of what life is for the Palestinians. Uh, especially since 1967. Do you see that the, the very interesting thing is that for, particularly for younger people, you've sketched something which is completely contrary to what most, I think, young people would see Israel as being. Um, the Holocaust is, is now such a central plank of the ideological argument. Um, and you're saying that in your childhood, it wasn't It was never mentioned. All. It was never mentioned. And uh, it, it is a, a politi when I say politicization of the remembrance of, of the Holocaust, to give a small example, because it is small, but actually uh, very, very poignant, the whole problem with Wagner, you know, that it is, yeah. you should not play There Wagner. were court cases over, you know, over you trying to play Wagner, and yeah. they eventually succeeding. But you know, in, in, in the end, the argument is what? The argument is 
I'm trying to put this objectively as I can. The argument is, for better or for worse, there is an inevitable association between Wagner's music and the Nazi regime. True. Therefore, whether the association uh, was only used or abused is of no interest. Uh, what is important is that this, this has left such an impact on, on the memory that it cannot be ex uh, expected of survivors of the Holocaust to be faced with the fact that the music of Richard Wagner would be played on Israeli soil. First of all, I don't know what gives a government the right to decide what is tolerable or intolerable for somebody who has suffered the horrors of the Holocaust. I'm perfectly in agreement with the fact that as long as these generations are alive, there is no reason to confront people with the obligation to go and hear Wagner. I would be against uh, any Israeli orchestra playing Wagner in a subscription concert, where if you were a loyal subscriber, you had a ticket for 12 concerts a year, you don't, and you can't listen to this music, why should you be faced in the fifth concert suddenly uh, a work of Richard Wagner, and you don't want to then stop going to the concerts, etc., etc. But if you make a Wagner concert, which is not on a subscription, where everybody who actually wants to hear it has to go to the box office or now in the internet uh, and buy a ticket for it, where is the problem? If I suffer from this terrible association, then I don't go. But why should I be able to impose upon you, who maybe fortunately do not suffer from this association, or why should I allow the government to stop you from going to hear that simply because of this? And I give the, when, when this subject is mentioned, I always give the example of the great Jewish Hungarian writer, Imre Kertes, who was in Auschwitz and who suffered the horrors of the Holocaust to, in its fullest uh, possible way. And when I met him, and uh, we became friendly very quickly, and the first thing he ever asked of me was to help you get a ticket to Bayreuth. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, you, you understand what I'm saying? The, there is a, there is a, uh, there is a, uh, something that Israeli government, governments, um, in the last whatever number of years it is, have taken upon themselves to, which is a lack of, of it, actually it is a lack of democratic incentive. I, I want to just... Uh, and that, of course, influences the whole issue with the Palestinians, mm. needless to say. I mean, if I yeah. start on that, I don't think you have enough time. Uh, we well, have enough no, time. We were, we were going to get onto that, but I, the, 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 I, there was one thing that I wanted to do before we reached that, and that is what happened to your own personal journey within this evolving... Uh, within this evolving environment of Israel. At what point well, did you, you said, you know, I, the, the, people have no idea now today of the lives of Palestinians. You intersected with them because, of course, they were very present in society in service and in, in, in all sorts of ways. I mean, e even I, when I first went to Israel, if we arrive at a Ben-Gurion airport, your bags would be sorted and carried by Palestinians. Today they are Sri Lankans or Thais or... Or, um, Philippines. Philippines. So uh, what, what, what happened to your journey? You arrived there well, at age 10, yes. knowing nothing. But the, the Israeli political narrative of the time was the Jewish people uh, suffered uh, throughout history from anti-Semitism in Europe, the Dreyfus case in France, <clears throat> so many, the Schmelnitsky in Ukraine who murdered so many Jews, the Spanish Inquisition. In other words, you see that it's not an odd moment, but it is something that goes throughout history and without any uh, limitation of boundaries in Spain, in Ukraine, in Russia, in, uh, in France, in Germany, and of course culminating uh, uh, with the Holocaust, of course, and therefore we, the Jewish people, because of the historical uh, uh, rights, have a uh, 
possibility and the right to settle in the land of our ancestors, etc., 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 etc. And this is we came here, and then uh, we were so thrilled on the 29th of November 1947 when there was the uh, resolution for the partition of Palestine. We were so thrilled to get just a small piece of land. The Arabs didn't want to share with us. Um, and therefore, the State of Israel was created. And the next same night or the next day, six Arab nations attacked the State of Israel. We fought bravely against them, and we won the war. And since then, we are constantly under threat. This was a political uh, narrative. I was 10 years old. I, I have to admit I didn't have the capacity to <clears throat> intellectual capacity to check all of that and to really see, but this was this was the the the, uh, the narrative. In fact, uh, because of this narrative, I believe, and I, now I have to digress a little if you allow me. I believe that so many opportunities were missed by Israeli government in the fifties. <clears throat> this is, by the way, very. Uh, uh, I think objectively and very clearly uh, described in Avi Schleim's uh, book, The Iron War, um, there were so many opportunities that were missed to make contact with the Arabs, including the great Arab nationalist uh, Nasser, who took over from General Najib in 1952. In his program, there was nothing. The word Israel was not even mentioned. He was interested uh, in the social conditions of his people in Egypt, et cetera, et cetera. So many other, so many other things. And, uh, do, do you know an interesting parallel with that? I was in Tahrir Square this time last year, and the word Israel was never mentioned. Never mentioned. No. Uh, the entire issue was Egypt's of social development. Yeah. And so right. you're still... There's still that but opportunity. I think Israel missed three opportunities. There were three revolutions or revolutionary developments in Egyptian society, and Israel missed the opportunity on all three cases. The first one in 1952 with Nasser, the second one in 1979 and 80 with Sadat, when Sadat uh, took the great uh, risk to go to Jerusalem, and he really needed at that time mostly economic support which he did not get from uh, the Israeli government at that time, headed by, uh, by Begin. And therefore, the Egyptian people turned against him because he made peace with Israel, which they didn't understand why. And on top of that, he asked them to tighten their belt because there was no money. And that because of all the Egyptian history of the point, instead of, uh, of uh, saluting this, uh, Israel remained very, very, very uh, tight and, and, and short on that. And the third time was, of course, last year, when, as you rightly said, the word Israel was mentioned. But you heard a lot from Israel immediately about the dangers of this revolution. We don't know what will be the end of the Arab revolution, with Egypt, now Syria. I don't, would not attempt to to uh, make a guess about that. But the mere fact that a society basically of 80 million people in Egypt is able to peacefully go to Tahrir Square and demand change, change for themselves, for better conditions of life, not only economically, economically, of course, but also of freedom and of, of trying to do things. This has to be saluted. The first thing you have to do in a case like this, both morally and strategically, if I may say so, from Israel's point of view, it should have saluted that and not say, well, if we do that, then we will only, this it doesn't work like this. It should be saluted and then hope that, that it works. But if you immediately say we are concerned about this, what do you expect people to say? Of course they will be against any contact with Israel, any acceptance of this. At, at what point did Palestine begin to invade your music? I became aware, as it were, of the lack of knowledge that uh, I had and I felt all my generation had 
from Israel in the 50s. In 1970, I was very far away. I was in Australia. Uh, uh, and it was this terrible black September in Jordan where so many thousands of Palestinians were killed by a Jordanian authority, the black September. And the then Israeli uh, Prime Minister uh, Golda Meir said in an interview, um, what is this whole talk about the Palestinians? There is no such a thing as the Palestinian people. The Palestinian people are we. We are the Palestinian people because we live in what used to be Palestine. And I said, I thought, just a moment. I must, <laughs> I missed on something here. And that's how I started sort of educating uh, uh, myself. And uh, uh, it was not so easy because the new uh, historians that have since come up with so many uh, documents and so many different analyses uh, were not in existence uh, yet. But little by little, I met more. Uh, I was very curious. Is that the period you met Edward Said? No, 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 no. Long before. This is now 1970. I only met Edward in 1992. Mm. Oh, no, no. It's a long time before that. And then I had a very uh, interest. I, I, I was part of a very interesting coincidence for me. And I was, that was, I was in Prague in 1966, therefore one year before the war, with the English Chamber Orchestra. And uh, the day after we played, there was a concert of Arthur Rubinstein with the Czech Philharmonic. Um, and I finished the rehearsal with the English Chamber Orchestra, and two young men my age, I was 23, my age, they must have been, came and introduced themselves, and they said they were young musicians from Syria. Now, I had never met a Syrian <laughs> in my life, and I had no idea that there were Syrian uh, Western musicians. Where would I uh, come, come in touch with them? But they were very charming. They were my age, and so we went out uh, and had coffee and sort of conversation and this, that, and the other. And, um, after the concert, after the English Chamber con uh, Orchestra concert, to which, of course, uh, I invited them, they asked me whether I could uh, help them get into the Rubinstein rehearsals. And I said, yes, I'm going to the rehearsal anyway. I can't stay for the concert because I'm leaving in the afternoon. I'm going, I will, <coughs> you can come with me. So there I go to uh, the Rubinstein rehearsal. He's playing the Brahms B-flat concerto with the Czech Philharmonic with my two newly acquired Syrian musician friends. And uh, after the rehearsal, of course, I went uh, <coughs> to see Rubinstein. And I thought he was such a curious human being, too. He would really enjoy meeting him. So I said, come, come along. I will take you. So I took the two Syrians to Rubinstein. And after uh, I greeted him, and uh, I said, and I would like to introduce to you two young musicians from Syria. He says, musicians from Syria? <laughs> he was so uh, uh, taken by it that he invited them to lunch. <laughs> for which, unfortunately, I couldn't stay. So that, that, that was the day. And uh, then one of them uh, was, became the director of the conservatory in Damascus. I lost all touch. Then came the war, and I lost all touch. I had no contact whatsoever. Um, and uh, 33 years later, 33 years later, when Edward Said and I founded the Divan, he was uh, very important in encouraging young Syrian musicians to come to the Divan, because he remembered all this uh, incident. It's actually quite quite a touching story. But in any case, I, I, bec I was very curious and I began to get more and more the feeling that something was not quite right with the narration uh, as I had heard it as a child. And I found also many um, Israeli mainstream people, if for want of a better word, uh, who said, yes, yes, it's not quite right and thing, but we had no choice. 
That was the best they could say. We had no choice. And um, in fact, I wrote quite a lot about all of this in my first book. I say that not in, not in order to make publicity for my first book, but to show you that I had already made all this journey before I met Edward. And in fact, I met Edward at what was then the Hyde Park Hotel in Knightsbridge uh, as I was checking in. And he approached me. And he says, uh, you would know who I am. I'm Edward Said. I said, of course I know who you are. I said, I don't, don't look, didn't know what you looked like, but I know Orientalism, etc." cetera. And, um, and he said, I want to talk to you. He said, because I think you are a great musician. He said, we will forget all of that. That's not important. But I read in your book all what you wrote. And that's very interesting, because I've never heard an Israeli uh, talk about it. And this was, in fact, the beginning of the friendship with Edward. And from it sprang the orchestra. Which is, again, one of those legends that is, uh, has not much to do with uh, reality, because uh, Edward Said was uh, one of the most intelligent uh, human beings I ever had the good fortune uh, to meet. And uh, without being unduly arrogant, I don't really think of myself as the most stupid of all people, uh, and that the two of us would think, and now we are going to create this wonderful orchestra. This is, of course, rubbish, <laughs> to use good English. Rubbish. <laughs> what we wanted was, in 1999, when Weimar was declared a cultural capital of Europe, to create a forum at the request of the authorities who were running the, the, the festival, to create a forum where young people from the Middle East, from all the countries of the Middle East, therefore Israel, Palestine, Syria, etc., etc., all the countries, would come together for a seminar, for a workshop of music making and conversation on uh, humanistic subjects and, of course, the, uh, the conflict. And we thought of somewhere between 10 and 15 young uh, musicians, and Edward would have come, and I would have worked with them, etc., etc. And this is how we really got started on the idea. Um, but I was very much aware of the fact that we knew a lot more about the standards, musical standards of the Israeli musicians that we knew about Arab, even Edward, who knew everything that there is to know about uh, the Arab world, had no idea about uh, the level of musicians. And uh, we thought about it and decided to ask the Goethe Institute, which is the cultural arm of the German uh, government, to help us make auditions in the Arab countries so that we would start there knowing what to expect from Israel and to see what we would find there. And therefore, my then assistant at the Staatsoper, who is today the music director of the Frankfurt Opera, Sebastian Weigle, I asked him to go, since I could go myself, I asked him to go to Damascus, Beirut, Amman, and Cairo to make auditions organized by the Goethe Institute. And you can imagine my surprise, and Edward's, of course, when we had more than 200 applications from only in these four countries. Over 200 applications for a workshop with Edward Said and with me for two weeks or three weeks, whatever it was, in, in Weimar in 1999. And uh, then he went. And he listened to many of them. Others sent uh, uh, tapes, video or audio tapes. And he reduced, he made the initial selection. He reduced from 200 plus to 60, and then down to 40 or 30. And I listened to those, and I made a, a still final selection from that. And only then did we send him to 
Tel Aviv and Jerusalem to see what you could find in Israel. And that was my first surprise that the best of the Arab musicians were no less good than the best of the Israelis, although in Israel there was a much greater tradition of, uh, of, uh, of music. The worst or the less good of the Arab were in fact less good than the lowest, the lowest mm. standard of law. But it was clear from that that we had to make an orchestra. There was no way that we could justify a selection of from that to only 10 or 15 to make a little uh, chamber music group. And this is how the West Eastern Divan started, came into being. But if you then track um, from that foundation to its present vibrant condition and the work that you're doing, has anything happened that makes you feel that what you've achieved has in any way been matched or uh, approached by people who believe they want to make peace? No, but you see, this is what uh, very often in my uh, more negative or depressed moods uh, gives me encouragement that we must be doing something right since we have uh, more or less equal um, support, mental support, and equal level of criticism in the Arab world and in Israel. So if everybody was all of those who are against the idea are against the idea, there must be something right about it. If it was only one side, if it was only one side, then one would ask oneself the question. In 1999, when they came to Weimar, there were 60%, if not more, of the orchestra that had never played in an orchestra. I would say more, more like 70, but. And 40% had never heard a live concert of an orchestra. Okay. And they were confronted with the Seventh Symphony of Beethoven and the Schumann Cello Concerto with Yo-Yo Ma. Yo-Yo was completely fascinated by the idea, and uh, I think sort of the quiet, secret, feeling of Chinese imperialism in him. <laughs> <laughs> Made him want to join us, and he played a wonderful role. He gave classes, and he gave master classes. In fact, there was a 15-year-old boy uh, from the area, from Weimar, who came and took lessons from Yo-Yo, who is today the principal cellist of the Staatskapelle, who played yesterday. So the connection is really quite, quite uh, uh, wonderful. So how is it possible that in eight years we could go from an orchestra of which the percentage was, as I just said, to playing one of the most difficult works in the repertoire, like the Schoenberg Variations at the Salzburg Festival, on the level that the orchestra did? In fact, one of the players who played there is sitting right there as an extra guest she played. Um, how is this possible? I mean, we are all geniuses, we know, but still, <laughs> in eight years. And the reason was that we were able, without uh, having the possibility to calculate it, we were able to build, to build a strategy for the development of the musicians in a way that uh, was quite, quite unique. In other ways, in other words, the young musicians were trained by principal players from the Staatskapelle, and at that time, brass from Chicago. And in 2002, in other words, only three years after it was started, we were offered a home by the government of Andalusia, who created this foundation um, and gave us the means not only to continue the program, because it's very expensive, uh, to bring together young musicians from the Middle East, but some of them are in America, God knows where they are, to bring them all together, to feed them for three weeks. Uh, in other words, you have to find them a place to live, to feed them, etc., etc., etc. Uh, it's, it's quite a, 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 a substantial amount of money. 
and they gave us all this, plus they gave me an uh, average of 150,000 euros um, to give scholarships. So what happened? A, a talented musician came from the Middle East and had the advantage of working for three hours, for three weeks with a top musician from the Staatskapelle. Then he had the whole workshop with me, with all the rehearsals, and then we started touring and playing concerts, etc. And at the end, this, this is all from the sort of middle of July, and at the end of August, when the, the period was finished, I was able to say to him, you're very talented, you've made a lot of progress, if you would like, now you can have a scholarship to go to Berlin and continue working with the same teacher for the next year. And many of them took advantage of that, with the result that the following July, when they came back, they were by themselves 30% better. And this is why it was possible to make such quick progress. In my experience, the, the uh, attitude towards uh, young orchestras and uh, and uh, projects with young musicians are not followed through. In other words, they said, and there have been wonderful programs in this country, the English National Youth Orchestra, uh, at the time still with Abado and, and many other. You know, they, they get very good people to teach them. They do this workshop, and that's the end of it. But it's really what happens after that that mm -hmm. is so important. And this is why the musicians were able to, to make uh, spiral. Uh, improvements. But do you think that this could be extended into other parts of, of intercommunal life? Or is, does it have to take uh, something with the extreme excellence which kind of removes it from the political fray? Well, it's not just the excellence, it's the fact that music in the end is uh, the most, uh, in my view, the most unique combination of the most personal that is possible for a human being with the most abstract at the same time. You and I may interpret certain events in the world differently and we may have different ideas about uh, intellectual matters, about economic matters, about political matters, what it is, and also about music, uh, uh, musical matters. But when you and I are sitting on the same stand of a string section in an orchestra, the music is more important than you and I, and the music uh, is responsible for the fact that at that moment, you and I are going to think alike. Mm -hmm. The moment you and I have thought alike on the first note, how to play the same note with the same volume, with the, right, the same intonation, the same volume, the same length, the same expression, the same vibrato, if it's a string instrument, et cetera, the same, the same, the same, the same. And we do that for six or seven hours every day for three weeks. But by the time the evening comes, we have acquired the ability to think alike about something for which you and I are very passionate about. And this has to transmit itself to something else. And I don't it, know how it, you do, would do, do you, that. Do you I don't know how you would do that without the music. Well, do, do you earwig in on conversations at, at supper afterwards? Do, do, oh, yes, we have. They, but we have do meetings. They, what do they talk about? Do they, oh, but, do but they we have talk talked about what else they could Look, do? Look, the best thing I can say is we have stopped talking about the conflict because we have done that for so many years. We know what everybody thinks. We know. Uh, what uh, everybody expects, and therefore we have to go on. And you we see, have simply learned to accept the fact that somebody whom we actually like, in some cases are even attracted uh, to, we continue to disagree about this, and we have learned to spend time together, I won't say live together, but spend time together, knowing that we disagree, that we will not attempt anymore to convince the other one about this, but that we know that whether we like it or not, we are blessed or cursed to living in a way that we have some kind of contact with but each you've other. Taken us this is what it does. You've it's not an orchestra for peace. It's an orchestra for this. But you've taken us to the very heart of what I think uh, both mystifies and, and excites everybody in this room about you. 
you've described exactly what happens to a musician. The whole business of being six or seven hours sharing a stand, absorbed in this experience, and sharing this experience. And in one sense, it's that for many, that detaches them from the real world and they live in this gorgeous arena. Very hard work, but nevertheless, yeah. utterly uplifting and absorbing yeah. life. So what is it about you that enabled you to connect so earthily with the conflict? And with the, no, because, because music... Mo most musicians are not connected to the no, conflict. No, but music, music is obviously a, 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 a very spiritual activity. Right. You cannot describe it anywhere else. And has all the, the abilities to inspire human beings to do all the things that we have just talked about. But music is also extraordinarily physical. In the end, it is purely physical. Objectively speaking, it's physical. There is no sound here. You bring a musician here, he makes a sound. He literally brings this sound to the real world. And therefore, this is what adds to the fact that we think about it. Because after all, if you have uh, two uh, uh, young people who are very interested in philosophy and they study together, they will also immerse themselves six or seven hours together in the study of philosophy. But this will not give them the possibility to physically have to express that together. This is, the, the, I think, the, the strength of the music. And I have been, and this is, the, in fact, was the basis of uh, my friendship with Edward uh, Said uh, was that we were uh, very unhappy about, about many things, but about two things in particular. One was the, uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict in all its aspects and uh, ramifications. Um, and we were very concerned with the lack of curiosity, that I must say on both sides, because there are many aspects of the conflict that are asymmetrical, starting from the fact that Israel is a powerful nation and uh, the Palestinians haven't got uh, a nation as yet, but uh, et cetera, et cetera. But there are some aspects of the con conflict that are absolutely symmetrical. And the first uh, aspect that is symmetrical is the lack of curiosity about the others. And Edward and I were very concerned about that, and that's why one of the main reasons we got involved with this project. And the second uh, subject that uh, bothered us very much and still continues to bother me, in fact, more and more as the years go about, is that music has been seen for many years and is becoming so much more so now an expression of an ivory tower. Mm. In other words, the, uh, there's no music education in the schools. So if you are born into a family anywhere, in England, in America, in Australia, wherever, uh, where no music is being made, nobody sings, nobody plays, there's no recordings, nothing. It's the great majority of people. And then you go to kindergarten, no contact with music. You go to school, no contact with music. You are talented, you go to university, you become a doctor or a lawyer. Now you are in your 20s, you have children, you have a family, and somebody, a friend, says to you when you are 29 or 32, oh, you know, have you heard the Vienna Philharmonic? I said, Vienna Philharmonic, what is that? Hmm. You say, the Vienna Philharmonic is one of the greatest orchestras in the world. And you say, well, an orchestra is where musicians play. I have nothing to do with it. Or you must go to that. It's, it's really the most wonderful orchestra in the world. And you know, when, if you're in London, when they come to London, it would be good for you to be seen at that concert too by all your friends. <laughs> and so you go to the concert of the Vienna Philharmonic in the festival hall where they play the same Schoenberg variations. What can you get out of that? Zero. Zero. Therefore, we have to deal with the fact that the people who go to concerts, and we are 
so happy and so grateful to them that they come. And I think of that every time. And after so many years, people still want to come and hear me play wrong notes. I think this is absolutely <laughs> wonderful. And you have all these people who come to be, what a journey they have made, because they had no help from society, from education and things. And therefore, it is, a completely, it is completely in an ivory tower. And on the other hand, you have children who have an aptitude for music and maybe ambitious parents, and they send them to the conservatories or to the academies to study music. And they study music. And how do they study music? They study music also in an ivory tower. They are taught about how to play hemi-demi semi-quavers. What a wonderful word, no? Hemi-demi semi-quavers, <laughs> softly, loudly, short notes, long notes, powerfully, sentimentally, etc., etc. But they are completely ignorant of everything else that has actually had been happening and is con still happening next to music, literature, painting, uh, human condition, philosophy, all of that. I'm not trying to say that you can explain the Beethoven symphonies from a philosophical uh, system point of view. But it is obvious that Beethoven was not just a master of harmony and counterpoint, that he had an important uh, statement uh, to make. And therefore, that statement must have had some connection of the statements that were being made by other great ma men at that time. And the mere fact that today, so many hundreds of years later, we are still interested in the Beethoven symphonies. And, 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 and those of us who are musicians continuously work on them, and those who, who, who are listeners go and listen to them, there must be something about it. But all this is totally absent from the musical education in the conservatories. And therefore, but, you have, and therefore you have both from the uh, uh, performing musicians to the public a, a creation of something which is, can, in my view, can only be described as an ivory tower. Well, now, when you put, so sorry, but now when you put that together with the conflict, where there's also each one living his ivory tower, the Israeli in his ivory tower, and they are on the, in there are, it is a, a absolutely a, a, a essential to put all of this together. And this is what the divan is about. Well, you, you've elegantly um, pulled us into the finale direct from the overture. Just tell me this, are you optimistic about the Middle East or downcast? Optimism sometimes is a form of self-defense. Mm. You see, in the end, the beauty of your eclecticism is that you're a philosopher as well as <laughs> everything else. Um, it's been a, it has been the promised treat. So thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>